This video is sponsored by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform for building your brand and growing your business online. More on this later. When I look at a bowl of ramen these days, I can see so many hidden things, so much secret knowledge that just wasn't there five years ago. What's up guys, salut, this is Alex. Today I've decided to share with you three things that I learned from my five years making ramen. Three things that will change the way you make ramen at home. Now, most of the things I've learned, you can get them from books or YouTube videos, but there are certain things that you can only learn if you walk the path. During these five years, I've not only been making ramen regularly, but I've also met world-class ramen chefs. If you achieve that, you're gonna make crazy ramen. A bad bowl of ramen is when you have no flavor. That's the worst, it's the worst. But that happens to me a lot. Internet ramen legends. I've studied the theory behind ramen making. I've visited top tier noodle factory. I've even opened a restaurant for one night and served over 300 bowls of ramen. Before we start all this, let's make sure that we are all on the same page when it comes to ramen. Ramen is a Japanese soup noodle dish that is super salty, savory, and extremely satisfying. Every bowl of ramen has five key elements. The broth, the noodles, the tare, which is a seasoning sauce, a bit of oil, and a few toppings. Japanese ramen noodles are the epitome of a popular street food. It delivers a lot of flavor, it's very salty, it's easy and quick to eat, it's affordable. And finally, as for most delicious foods in this world, it holds tons of fat. Fat is not always evil. In fact, fat serves many different roles in a dish. The first one is to bring richness to a dish and juiciness and unctuousness pleasure. Basically. In ramen, it is mandatory. I traveled to New York to meet Chef Ivan Orkin, a ramen superstar featured in Chef's Table on Netflix, and he told me that without fat, ramen is not ramen. Now, the second role of fat is to distribute and convey flavors across the palate. Why do you think Italians add a, a drizzle of olive oil everywhere? Fat has this amazing capacity to absorb and release flavors. So thanks to this, in every bite, you get all the flavors of the dish. Fat is like a flavor conveyor belt, more or less. Now, the last role of fat, and this one is very, very specific to ramen, it's the bond that it creates between the noodles and the broth. While eating a bowl of ramen at Kodawari restaurant in Paris, accompanied by Jean-Baptiste, a Paris-based ramen master chef, which geekiness is just on another level. The guy grows his own wheat to make ramen noodles. He made this stark truth clear to me. The link between the soup and the noodle will be fat. The link between the soup and the noodle will be fat. Without fat? The broth doesn't stick. No. So you use oil. A, a teaspoon of oil. Oh, it's not enough. Not enough. No, no, uh, fat, I, I, I fat is life, you know. Think about it. A ramen noodle without any broth on it is gonna taste absolutely flavorless. Yum. A bad bowl of ramen is when you slurp the noodles and in, and your, in your mouth yeah. you have no flavor. You just have naked noodles in your mouth. That's the worst. It's the worst. But that happens to me a lot. So, practically speaking, next time you're gonna make a bowl of ramen at home, do not do what I did in the past. Don't be shy. Don't go for one teaspoon of oil. No. With such a minuscule amount, you won't be able to enjoy the true pleasure of ramen and to enjoy the broth itself, which takes hours and hours to make. Such a waste. Instead, I recommend using two or three tablespoons of fat. I know it seems like a lot, but trust me, it's not, okay? And that is the importance of fat in ramen. I wish I knew about all this when I started. I wouldn't have had to eat so many bland bowls of ramen. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. All right, so you've just learned something crucial about fat. Now let me share something a little surprising and maybe a little disappointing about noodles. So I started making them by hand or rather using my feet 
because the pressure required to knead the dough is much greater than what arms can produce. Then I decided to move on to a cheap Italian pasta machine. Quickly did I realize that they are not up to the job. I broke another pasta machine. And lastly, I decided to enlist the help of a fellow YouTuber and very talented machinist, this old Tony, to design a custom-made and industrial-grade noodle machine. I know what you're thinking. Great, Alex, so making noodles at home is doable, in fact. Uh, I guess with like dedication and discipline, it's possible. But then I should probably point out that since you're not gonna have access most likely to an industrial grade noodle machine, you'll have to sweat blood and tears, kneading the dough by hand, or be prepared to break your pasta machine. You see the hydration of ramen noodles, that is the amount of water that is present in the dough, is much lower than that of Italian pasta. And it basically means that ramen noodle dough is gonna be much harder to knead. Much, 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 much harder. It feels like the dough is never gonna come together. It's never gonna work. Do you see where this is going? Making ramen noodles at home is not worth it. It's not worth it. If I did not own a custom noodle machine, I would buy them. I mean, especially with brands like Sun Noodles out there, with the broth, if you put in the efforts and the hours, you can make amazing broth. Same goes with the tare, same goes with the oil or the toppings. But with the noodles, it doesn't work like this. You need the machine. Sun Noodles has enormous machines. Uh, Kodawari in Paris, they've got crazy machinery. Even with my machine, I'm not getting to their standards. Okay, now I'm not saying you should never try to make them at home, do it, you'll learn a ton. But I'm saying even with all the skills, all the knowledge, all the experience that I've got, the maximum I can get to is 50% of a professional noodle. I know it can be a bit disappointing, but I wish I had known about this when I started this journey. Hashtag thank me later. Now is the time for me to share my most precious secret. Mm. As part of my ramen series, I visited Kodawari, an amazing ramen spot here in Paris. During a discussion with Jean-Baptiste, the world-class chef, he said something very striking and even unsettling to me. You need to start working on uh, umami. Start working on uh, umami. 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 I was a bit taken aback from this remark. I mean, what do you mean work on my umami? Isn't just umami present in all foods? Is there a knob I can turn? How do I do this? I mean, of course I heard about umami. I heard about it. That is exactly the problem. I heard about it. I learned about it with the mind of a Westerner. Umami is not part of my memories growing up. I mean, sure, umami is present in many Italian or French dishes, but it's never explicitly mentioned. I should probably go even further. It's never intentionally present. Good uh, French food or good Italian food, but there is not this quest of umami. And that is an enormous problem, because like umami is key when it comes to Japanese cuisine, and umami is very intentional when it comes to ramen. Super explicit. All these realizations sent me off to a quest to understand really what umami is. I had the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Kumiko Ninomiya, a renowned Japanese food scientist. She's got a PhD in umami. The organization Dr. Kumiko Ninomiya works for is called the Umami Information Center. They've got a whole ministry dedicated to umami. Talking with her, I learned that umami translates roughly to deliciousness in Japanese. In English, we usually describe umami as a savory sensation. It is thought of as the fifth taste, along with salty, sour, bitter, and sweet. The chemical substance responsible for umami is called monosodium glutamate, or as I'm sure you may have heard of, MSG Fuyo. This substance is present naturally in loads of foods. Now, there are foods which contain way more umami than others. I mean, I kind of knew all this, to be honest. But then, 
it started getting more interesting. The Umami Information Center has created a database that lists different food with the exact concentrations in milligram of MSG. And so you're able to identify foods that are more concentrated in MSG, and so you can use them in your broth, and so amp up the umami sensation. That is amazing. But then she went further. In this database, you can also find ingredients which do not contain any MSG themselves, but they work as umami boosters. When you pair a booster ingredient with an umami-rich ingredient, they magnify the perception of umami in our mouth. We are not changing the amount of MSG, but the mm. perception is stronger. Yeah. By up to a factor of eight times eight times more satisfying, eight times more savory, eight times better. Two power ingredients that you should become familiar with are dry Japanese seaweed called kombu. That seaweed is very rich in MSG. And the other one is dried Japanese fish flakes called katsuobushi. And this one is very rich in umami booster. When you combine these two ingredients by steeping them in hot water, you create the foundation of Japanese cuisine, the broth called dashi. Honestly, this should be the start of your umami exploration. Dashi is basically liquid umami. Ultimately, my advice to you is the following. Don't think of umami as an obscure and vague concept. No. Umami is real and you can even quantify it. You can measure it. Use kombu seaweed in your broth, but also in your tare seasoning sauce. And why not in your aromatic oil as well? Furthermore, please consider the synergistic effect you achieve when combining umami rich ingredients with umami booster ingredients. The difference between the bowls of ramen I used to make and the bowls of ramen that I make today is like night and day. That is perhaps the most important takeaway from my whole ramen adventures. So I guess these were the things I learned during my five years of making ramen and learning about ramen. I hope you enjoyed and but I mostly hope that you will use these professional tips and tricks that I got from world-class chefs. I wish Alex from five years ago had access to this type of knowledge. We we'll catch up in the next one. Bye-bye. Salut. Isn't that beautiful? I'll talk about this someday. Okay, so let's talk about today's sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace has the tools you need to get your business off the ground, including e-commerce templates, inventory management, a very simple checkout process, and secure payments. Secure. Whatever you sell, Squarespace has merchandising features to make your products look their best online. Something I've noticed and I would love to push is that Squarespace makes it easy for chefs and creators to monetize their content and expertise in a way that fits their brand. With member areas, you can unlock a new revenue stream for your business and free up time in your schedule by selling access to gated content like video classes, online courses, or even newsletters. Check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash French guy to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. Thank you Squarespace for sponsoring this video.